to a few people, write about what happened in their times, and frankly, increasingly, too few know how to write. Uh, so last several weeks, we've had these big debates about leaders of the past, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sardar Patel, Krishna Menon. Uh, and one important thing that you see while you watch all these debates is that all these people left a lot of record, a lot of paperwork. Even a leader who we don't talk about a lot these days, and in fact, Narendra Modi said the other day in an interview that people like him have also come and gone past, but nobody remembers them. Charan Singh, Chaudhary Charan Singh has left a volume of papers that Paul Brass has now put together in a bunch of volumes of publications. So today, we don't have much of that. That's why it is such a wonderful idea that Montek, you put this book together. And this is not just about your UPA years, but UPA years are the most recent 10 years. So backstage. So first of all, Montek Sigaluvalia, welcome to Off the Cuff. And now, be off the cuff for once. <laughs> you are much too cautious and diplomatic always. So why this book? Given the fact that you are so cautious and so diplomatic. Well, I don't know if I'm cautious, but you know, why this book is a good question. But you question. survived. Oh, that's the proof that I'm yeah, cautious. Yeah, you're cautious, yes. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I felt that, you know, we need to have different narratives. This is not a history. Uh, in fact, in the prologue, I say it's also not a memoir. Because, you know, memoirs tend to focus on what the individual did. And I think I was put off the idea, I say, of writing a memoir because somebody described a memoir as a selfie in book form. And, you know... <laughs> Don't give people ideas. <laughs> it will begin to happen like that. So the idea was really, I see it as a travelogue uh, in the whole journey of economic reform. I mean, most of my interests are in the economic sphere. Uh, and I just felt that, you know, I, had, I came back to India in 1979 just about when people were beginning to think that our economic policies really weren't delivering what we were hoping they would deliver. And it's been a slow process of change. I've been very privileged in being a participant, along with many others. So I felt that I should write about how things happened. I mean, what happened is well known. Uh, and of course, it's an analyst's job to judge whether the right thing was done, testing hypotheses. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just telling a story. In any case, economics should never be analyzed by economists. That's also true. And not in this city, at least. <laughs> so, Montek, uh, before we come to UPA, and uh, you know my colleague, Remya Nair, mm -hmm. who's our senior editor, and she covers... One man army. One, one woman, woman army. Hasoge, <laughs> 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 huh? <laughs> <laughs> one woman army. Uh, she covers business, economy, yeah. finance, everything for us. Uh, before UPA, there was... Narse Barao and Manmohan Singh. Before Manmohan Singh, two, two A and two B, that's UPA one and two. There was Manmohan Singh, one. That mm -hmm. was 1991. So uh, a lot of these people, a lot of the people in this hall <coughs> were not born in 1991. I guarantee that to you. Uh, and not many would have many memories of 1991. So give us an idea what India was like for a common person like us, pre-reform and post-reform? Well, <coughs> the, the, let's take 91 as the major reform, because actually the truly pre-reform India was uh, prior to 1980. Right. Old-fashioned, government control, suspicion of the private sector, think the public sector should do everything. It continued, except for one company, it, suspicion of the private sector continued. I think Reliance no. broke out. Well, Reliance certainly broke out, but I, I don't think it just, uh, I, I would say in the 1980s, I mean, Mrs. Gandhi came back in the 1980s, I write about it. We, we knew that, you know, she had in the past, on the economic side, sort of been very solidly anchored in the left view. And we wondered when she came, uh, came back, I mean, what would her position be? And the truth is that in the 1980s, she began to change. I mean, some of the policy statements brought in words like productivity, a little bit of liberalization here, a little bit of liberalization there. Uh, I worked for Rajiv Gandhi as prime minister. Now, you know, he was the first person 
to actually say we've got to get to the 21st century, which in those days, in 1985, was 15 years away. And in Parliament, he had said, we cannot expect to compete with other countries if we are working with systems that are 20 years out of date. You know, earlier, the approach was we must improve our systems. Here was a prime minister saying this system is totally out of date. But not that much got done in changing it because that's a different how politics worked. He didn't have much time, et cetera, et cetera. By the time you re reached 1991, I mean, we were in the middle of a balance of payments crisis that's in towards the end of the VP Singh government. So I think the time was ripe to actually use the crisis as an opportunity. And that is what that government did. Manmohan Singh as prime minister, was, as finance minister, was very aware that you needed broad ranging change. Narasimha Rao backed him fully uh, as uh, prime minister. And I think for the first time you got an articulation of a different kind of economic policy. So the before and after story, my favorite before and after stories, I've heard them before, but tell others. Uh, one, when I remember that, I start smelling gasoline in my nostrils. So this is a dry cleaning story and the credit card story, before and after reform. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I wear that figures, but I mean, it's true that uh, uh, personal life uh, before the reforms was very much mired in old-fashioned technologies. And a colleague of mine, N.K. Singh and I, NK Singh and uh, were sort of getting into some lift and we sort of felt that, you know, somehow there's a smell of petroleum in the air. And we came to the conclusion that it must be the dry cleaning that one of us had done on our suits. And also, the absence of credit cards made a huge difference. Because when you, when you landed up as a secretary to the government of India <clears throat> in a hotel, you didn't have a credit card that could be used internationally. Only India and Nepal. Yes, you could use it in India and Nepal. But actually, uh, that's true. But very few secretaries went to Nepal, so they never <laughs> <laughs> benefit of that, you know? I mean, when you, when you checked into a hotel in London or in New York, somebody from the embassy had to be there and sort of put their credit card just in case you undertook some expenses uh, that you later on didn't pay for. Uh, so, I mean, these are minor sort of, uh, minor sort of things, but most importantly... So that led to <coughs> modern dry cleaning machines being imported. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also Indian credit cards becoming valid overseas. Yes, that, that on the financial <coughs> side, that was a very major step. But that only illustrates, I mean, look, when I came back to India, one of the most onerous decisions you had to take when you bought a car was, are you going to buy an ambassador or a fiat. I mean, those were the only two choices available. So, you know, the range of consumer goods that expanded during and after liberalization, some of it was even before 91. I mean, after all, Maruti came on the stage in, it was the first Maruti rolled out in 1983. And it was Rajiv Gandhi, I think he realized that, you know, one of the strengths of India is a large middle class. And if you're going to have a large middle class, they're going to want consumer goods. So the old Mahalanobis strategy, which was totally anti the production of any consumer good, uh, had to go. So cha but change took place very slowly. I mean, in my view, I'm not a great believer in uh, big bang reforms, you know, doing everything in one year or two years. But in my view, what we did in 30 years, we should have been able to do in 15. And it's an interesting question, uh, why did it take so long? I mean, obviously, the, the usual answer is that the democratic environment, uh, no reform, un, except for management experts, nobody believes that reforms are a win-win uh, story for everybody, even in the short run. I mean, when you do reforms, you know, some people do get hurt. They have to do things differently. Uh, and in a democracy, I mean, everybody's view has to be taken into account. And that forces many compromises. That takes more time. Uh, well, I mean, I'd rather live in a democracy which reforms a little bit <laughs> over a longer time than not. Uh, but I still think that if we had a, if we had a clearer political uh, commitment to the need to do these things, we should have done what we did in 30 years, in 15 years or so. Uh, so you talk about how good economics makes for good politics in the long run. 
but except for probably 1991, uh, do you think the policy makers have adhered to this principle? Well, you know, the, the thing about 1991 was that it, it wasn't just something that was done, but that Dr. Manmohan Singh outlined, uh, if you like, the strategy <coughs> behind the new system. And the strategy was not a repetition of the old. But even there, I mean, we didn't do everything uh, that we should have done. I mean, things got done rather slowly. But you're right, it, it is ultimately uh, uh, the ability of the political system to sell the reforms uh, that really makes the biggest difference. Now, you know, if a politician looks back uh, at how things have moved, I think they would conclude that most of what has been done in reforms has been a winner. But the problem with uh, reforms is that, you know, uh, you reform and what that allows people to do uh, is to sort of excel in what they're capable of, their comparative advantage is revealed, etc. But, you know, they never, they never think that they're doing this because of the reforms. They think they're getting all these benefits because they themselves are good, and which is true. So by and large, uh, you need a, a lot of sophistication uh, for people to recognize that uh, it's the reforms that lead to uh, the benefits that they are currently uh, observing. Generally, people take it for granted, you know. So you also talk about how there's a need for the second generation reforms now so that, you know, the whole <coughs> middle income, India escapes the middle income trap. So, uh, you know, what kind of reforms that we should now see? Well, uh, what kind of reforms do we now need? Whether we see them or not depends on... You see, I think this is an important issue because um, India was a low... When the, when the reforms began in 1991, India was a low-income country. It crossed the, the, uh, the barrier between low-income and middle-income sometime in the middle of the UPA years. But it just sort of hopped across and came to the bottom of the middle-income range, right? There's a lot of research which says that at the low income level, there are some very low hanging fruits. I mean, there were obviously dysfunctional government controls which getting rid of uh, unleashed a lot of potential energy. As the system becomes more sophisticated and more complex, you need to develop the institutional ecosystem for such a system to actually function. And also, you need to develop the ecosystem that would, as it were, respectabilize the private sector. You know, it was very easy in 1991 uh, to say, look, we're not letting the private sector do what it is capable of doing. I mean, Rahul Bajaj, talking about a pre-reform story, Rahul Bajaj would bring the house down in Davos and other places by saying that, you know, <laughs> I'm uh, the largest scooter producer in India. And if I produce more than my permitted amount, I run the risk of going to jail. I mean, the policies were just cretinous. Uh, that's all one can say. But you know, as you liberalize, and then you get uh, more private sector activity, then you need to ask yourself, is the private sector actually properly governed? Is it subject to uh, the sort of competitive pressures that are necessary for them to be efficient? And you know, I don't share the view, and I think most people don't share the view, uh, a kind of an ideological free market view that all that you have to do is the government gets out of the way and the private sector will do everything and the market will do it. That's not the case. I mean, you clearly need to allow the private sector much more freedom and risk taking and give them a financial system that will support them. But at the same time, you have to ensure that they, they, they work under competitive pressure so that only efficient ones can actually expand. Only efficient ones can get money in order to expand. For that, you have to have a financial system that's capable of judging who's really efficient and, and who's not. Which also lets people fail. That's also very important because, you know, freedom of entry has to be associated with freedom of exit. And we, in this dimension, we have been bad, and I don't think we are improving uh, very much either. So Dr. Manmohan Singh as Prime Minister, and Dr. Manmohan Singh as finance minister before that. Uh, was it the same person or was it different persons? Well, that's a very good question because, you know, it wasn't the same economy and it wasn't the same circumstances. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think Dr. Manmohan Singh as finance minister, most people would agree 
that what he did in that very short period is truly historic. But of course, you know, he, uh, he came in, in uh, he was brought in by Mr. Narasimha Rao into a government that had inherited an unbelievable mess. So you could go to the public and say that, look, what you thought of as good policy just isn't working. So we've got to do something different, okay? I think he did more than just um, control the crisis because if they had only wanted to control the crisis, they could have stopped reforming by 1993. But they used the crisis as an opportunity to sell a new line that basically we are going to move towards a more private sector oriented economy much more open to the world, foreign investment is welcome, technology should be allowed more freely, and firms should decide the technology they want, not some babu. I mean, earlier, the babus were deciding, is this technology really good for India or not? So I think these were big changes, but you know, these are the low-hanging fruits when you're a low income. I think in country. many areas, they are still deciding. The same I, problems. <laughs> I, I think, it's, well, uh, they, I wouldn't be surprised, but much less than before. But, you know, Manmohan Singh, as prime minister, was the prime minister of a, a country that had about to become middle income, uh, was not running a government which had its own majority in parliament. It was dependent, it was not only a coalition, uh, but the Congress within that coalition did not have the same strength that the Congress within the Narsim Rao coalition or the Vajpayee... Although, remember, Narsim Rao government was a minority government. Yes, but, you know, but the extent one party of the... Government. Uh, very <clears throat> small. Here, they were dependent on the left from outside. And I think it's also true that within the party, I mean, he wasn't the natural choice of the party. I mean, he was appointed by the po political leader, who was Mrs. Gandhi. But in that uh, party, there were a dozen people who in their own eyes were the natural choices for prime minister, <laughs> who didn't get it. It's very good in parties for everybody to think that they are the natural choice Absolutely. and then to compete. I mean, that's the short answer. But I, I think, therefore, I don't believe that in, in UPA, as prime minister, he could have got away. Did he exercise any helplessness sometimes because of these circumstances? You mean, did he display any help? No, I mean, he doesn't display very much, <laughs> nevertheless. But did he, I mean, did you... Did you see any helplessness? No, no, I, I think he has himself said that in many areas he was constrained by what he called coalition dharma. I would interpret that to mean no, that... So what is it that constrained him more, coalition dharma or the party? That's very... I mean, I, you see, I had no role in the political discussions. There must have been political discussions within the party, but I was not part of them. So I would only be speculating. My guess is that both within the party, if you're not, if you're not uh, the spontaneous choice of the party, uh, you will experience constraints for the simple reason that others would express their views and would be able to lobby for them. But equally, being in the coalition, uh, you have to look at the support of, what kind of support you get from other parties. Was there ever an occasion when you had to say to him, or maybe you felt like saying to him, Ke, don't give in so easily. Well, there was one occasion which I mentioned in the book, uh, which actually, I mean, he, he himself uh, followed that uh, course of action. I'm not saying he did that because of what I mentioned, but that is really uh, on the nuclear, nuclear deal. Nuclear deal, yes. You know, it, in my view, it was one of the most important achievements of the UPA and a contribution to India's foreign policy and India's security strength. So let me just, uh, I don't think it's well understood in India. It was wrongly presented as a deal between India and the US designed to make India come close to the US. The truth is, and Manmohan Singh has said that on many occasions, that look, uh, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty had imposed a kind of nuclear apartheid on India. It was an unfair treaty because five countries allowed themselves to have nuclear weapons and prevented every other country from having it. We felt, we were, from the days of Rajiv Gandhi, we were arguing that we are willing to have universal disarmament, that we will commit ourselves not to have nuclear weapons if you commit yourselves in a phased manner to get rid of yours. 
but we're not prepared to accept a situation where we say no and you hang on to nuclear weapons. I think that was entirely a correct uh, reading of the situation. But nevertheless, the NPT came, and what the NPT said, I mean, put enormous restrictions on anybody who was not a declared nuclear weapon state. And the nuclear suppliers group basically would not trade either so fuel. So it was necessary to become a declared nuclear weapon state. But there was no mechanism to become a declared weapon state. That because was you frozen. had tested anyway. Yes. Now, so therefore, what the nuclear deal did was, it, the US helped us to get a waiver from the nuclear suppliers group, which in effect accepted India's nuclear weapons capability, but freed up technology, et cetera, for safeguarded nuclear reactors. This was a major breakthrough. And for some reason, there was enormous opposition domestically. I still haven't been able to understand why there was so much opposition. Uh, anyway, in the end, uh, Dr. Singh was under pressure. Uh, had he succumbed to the pressure, because the left threatened to walk out uh, if he proceeded further, had he succumbed to the pressure saying, let's be safe, And the left did walk out. The left did walk out. But you know, interestingly, the left did walk out. But Dr. Singh, with a bit of support from a few people, was able to get Malayam Singh and his party to come in and support the deal. And let me say that Mrs. Gandhi had backed him on that. I mean, I, you, you must be 100% certain that the nuclear deal would not have happened if Sonia Gandhi had not backed Manmohan Singh. I mention in the, in the book some conversations where you know, she made the point that, look, the party is not happy with facing an election, which may well have been the case. But I think what Dr. Singh felt was that he had negotiated a very good deal and it would be absurd not to carry it through. Now, you know, think about what would have happened if we had not done it. You know, some people might say, oh, well, it would have happened later. But the fact is the world has changed. I mean, Bush was able to get the Chinese to withdraw their objections. Would to not the happen today. Waiver. It would just not happen. Just not happen today. And I mean, quite apart from the fact that the deal got done uh, in the last couple of weeks, weeks of the Bush administration, and had it even slipped four or five weeks beyond that, a new democratic administration would have been in power. Now, they had many more uh, nuclear non-proliferation ayatollahs in the Democrats. So I'm not even sure that the US would have followed through. You know, President Obama moved a number of amendments to the uh, uh, 123 agreement, which would have been killers, which we would not have been able to accept. So the fact of the matter is, uh, it was a neatly mounted operation, and you cannot say that Dr. Singh flinched. Uh, it's a pity but, that it's not. But could, could he have shown the same courage when it came to that retrospective amendment? You know, uh, in all politics, I mean, you That's can always ask. That's <laughs> Well, well you know, my obviously view. Obviously, Vodafone at this point looks like it will go down <laughs> and drown in the Jamna and it's three feet water. But <laughs> No, no, look, in politics, you can't win every battle. Uh, but there was I, a battle. I don't know. If my view on that was very, I, I do mention. Yes, you uh, do. You know, the problem with the budget in India is a very secret affair. No, but the fact is that so you knew. I don't know what was, went on inside. So, Montek, but you knew that this was happening. Yes. You went and discussed it with Dr. Singh. Everybody knew the consequences no, of no, this. No, no, let me get this straight. I, I was invited uh, to uh, give suggestions to the finance minister, Mr. Pram Mukherjee. Uh, and I went to him and I said, look, I hear there's all a rumor uh, that this is being thought about, and I think it'll be a great mistake. We shouldn't do it. Because once the Supreme Court has pronounced, it would, it's very bad for us to amend the law mainly to overcome what the Supreme Court has pronounced. That's what I said. I, I didn't discuss it with uh, the Prime Minister, but I told the Prime Minister that, look, this is my view, and I've conveyed it to Pranam Mukherjee. You know, the reason I didn't discuss it with him is that the budget is associated with so much secrecy that it would be improper to discuss it in the sense of giving him, a, asking him, what do you think? That's why when people go to the finance minister, they just keep making suggestions, and he or she never says anything, and all this is regarded as proper uh, because of secrecy. I think it's one of, the, one of the best things we could do is to get rid of this secrecy nonsense and make the budget formulation an open process 
In fact, I see nothing wrong with the finance minister not making the budget a matter of uh, prestige uh, and say, look, I've discussed with a lot of people. This is what I think I'm going to do. Let's have a discussion on the tax side. And depending on the debate, I'll then make my final proposal. That would how, be much better. How will the TV channels get their ratings? That's if, a... It would demystify the budget. Uh, Ramya? But uh, could such a decision have been made on the retrospective amendments without the consent of the Prime Minister? Well, you know, the budget is technically, uh, the budget speech is approved by the Prime Minister. The, interestingly, the amendment is not mentioned in the budget speech. It is tucked away. But That's why when the budget came, the markets went up. And by the afternoon, when people had read this amendment, the markets fell. I, by the way, on that, I really want to debunk uh, the role of the you fellows on TV. No, no, okay. Have let's, made the let's, markets let's move on from the market. You know, all, all I'm I saying mean, is people read this nobody, amendment. Later, it was not in the budget somebody, speech. I'm endorsing you. Somebody should do a little analysis that silly little graph that keeps appearing on every TV screen during the budget. As the finance minister says, I'm spending this much money or changing this tax, they show what's happening to the sensor. Irrelevant, actually. And the market hasn't got a clue. In fact, more, my suspicion, by the way, is that punters use that opportunity to make short-term profit. So uh, Pranab Mukherjee, in his, in one of his, his series of memoirs, I think volume three, he mentions that he made this retrospective amendment. <clears throat> he sort of prefaces it by saying that unlike some of the others in my government, he especially mentions P. Chidambaram, I was of the socialist bent of mind. And there were disagreements. And then he says that I made this retrospective amendment, which became very controversial. A lot of people complained about it. But the fact is, since then, nobody has cared to. Nobody has had the courage to change it, so there must be something to it. <laughs> so, so do you see, I mean, will you join argument and say that, yes, since it stood the test of time and two full majority governments now, uh, which can abrogate Article 370 in one three-minute statement in Parliament, they've not been able to reverse that nonsensical amendment, which has yielded no PASA for the government. And now, now Vodafone will de declare bankruptcy, so see you later. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to comment on uh, what's going to happen. No, no, but, but, but uh, the argument, the intellectual no, argument. Uh, I think, you know, one of, one of the problems uh, is that when you, when you get a proposal, I can, uh, let me, let me put, put across the position that perhaps uh, uh, Pranam Mukherjee would have been in. If the revenue department makes a huge big case, that we can, we have a right to get X and Y thousand <coughs> crores of rupees by doing this. It requires a lot of guts to sort of say, no, this is the wrong so thing. So Pranam Mukherjee did not have the guts or did he have conviction in this idea? Well, I have no idea what happened. But I'll tell you my view. I believe that he's a statist and he thought, I am the sovereign, we'll do it. Well, I have no way of uh, either endorsing or rejecting that. But, but let me put it this way. Had that, issue, had that issue been discussed in a committee, maybe four or five ministers, and they asked the question, look, this is what we're thinking of doing. What do you think? I'm sure, by the way, there were discussions. I mean, individuals would have come and said, just like I did. But that's not the same thing as a collective view. I think if, if a collective view, if the system was one where you take a collective view, uh, there's much greater likelihood that some of these issues would come up. But unfortunately, in our system, every decision is done in a silo. And that collective view is very often not there. It's very difficult also for the prime minister to be micromanaging everything. I mean, this is the real problem. Ramya, and then Ms. Ajit. Uh, there's a lot of talk on how you know, uh, decision-making uh, decision is highly centralized in the current uh, regime, uh, in the prime minister's office. How was it in the previous tenures? No, it was certainly not uh, centralized. I mean, as uh, you know, in a, in a coalition government, things are not centralized. There are a few things that, let's say, the prime minister decides to drive by himself. But otherwise, I mean, the logic of a coalition government is that ministers who are responsible for certain things sort of end up doing uh, as best they can. And you know, I don't think. Although technically our system is one in which the prime minister can overrule any minister, the logic of that is that he can overrule the minister 
because the minister can always resign if he wants to. But if you're running a coalition, you can overrule your own party minister. You can't be overruling members of the That was the problem. Coalition. He did not overrule his own party ministers. They kept on overruling him. No, but I don't think that that's... Uh, your finance minister, your environment minister, they were all overruling your no, prime I minister. No, I think that's not fair because you should take environment, for example. I think on environment, frankly, uh, it's true that in the last uh, three years or so of the UPA, uh, environmental regulations became a constraint on the implementation of projects. But there was arbitrariness there. But, but you see, it is, it is not no, as if... I'm asking you, was there arbitrariness there in I how think the environmental ar decisions I think were taken? The taken? arbitrariness was inherent in the lack of clarity in the rules and regulations but we on had one of the victims sitting right there, Professor Pintel, because his, his mustard seed, if your government had allowed B.T. Brinjal, then somebody would have allowed his domestically yeah. developed mustard seed. Now, because your yeah, high-tech reformist government didn't allow it, this nationalist government wants to take you back to Vedic times. <laughs> so now, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, no, but let me, I, there I were think issues you, there. Uh, uh, one is environmental in the sense of projects that do damage to the environment. The other is environmental in the case of the mustard seeds and so on. I think there, frankly, um, there wasn't adequate homework done on what are the criteria on the basis of which decisions will be taken. So there and was arbitrariness, that's what it means. Yes, I think it's an institutional weakness. Uh, and I mean, I would say that that's a problem that exists, that too many institutions, which actually now have power, but are not staffed with an adequate scientific capacity to exercise that power in an intelligent way. And we need to do something about it. Uh, Mr. Jeet. In fact, in this case, the scientists had cleared it. Uh, the GEAC had cleared it. And then the minister not only uh, overruled them, but also took the power of clearance away from GEAC, from the scientists to himself and the bureaucrats. And I can't imagine S Dr. Manmohan Singh having been happy with it. Uh, sir, since you have uh, raised about the budget, on the 1st of February, <clears throat> the, the finance minister proposed an expenditure of 30 lakhs 42,000 Crore. out crores, out of which the biggest component is interest payment, that is 7 lakh 8,000. And the second biggest is establishment expenditure of the central government, which is 6 lakh 9,000 crores. Total expenditure, like if you take into account interest payment, then uh, this uh, budget, and then uh, subsidy, uh, defense, pension, grants, 22 lakh 28,000 crores are wiped out. That leaves only 8,000 crores. And our fiscal deficit is exactly 8,000 crores. So therefore, the point I'm making is, we are borrowing money, 8 lakh thousand crores, for our development expenses. How long can this go on, particularly in the context of minimum Governance, uh, uh, minimum but governance government. and maximum governance. But don't make those Freudian slips, you'll be taken seriously. <laughs> In this city, nobody can stop a bad idea whose time has come. <laughs> Six lakh, nine thousand crores of central government expenses. It increased from five lakh, forty six thousand crores. And there are a lot of off balance sheet figures. Yeah, okay. Despite the fact that food subsidy has gone down by seventy thousand crores. So, sir, are you not concerned about the fiscal deficit, which appears to be grim? Well, I'm very concerned. Actually, if you uh, look at my book, uh, there's a section in it called Epilogue. I mean, because uh, most of the book is uh, when I'm backstage in the government. Now I'm off stage, so I'm commenting on a part of the government, but I wasn't there. So I'm looking at it from the outside. Uh, I, I do mention that, you know, the size of the fiscal deficit in India is greatly underestimated. I mean, internationally, you don't just look at the central government. You look at the central government, and you look at the state government. And now you have all these disputes about whether the numbers are correctly calculated. There's no doubt in my mind that the fiscal deficit is grossly uh, too high. I mean, put very roughly, most people think that if you calculated it correctly, uh, it would be something like 8.5% of GDP, okay? And if you look at what is the financial system doing, 
the financial system normally generates revenue from the savings of households to make it available either to the corporate sector or to the uh, government. Now, that savings that they mobilize, net savings, is only about 10 to 11 percent of GDP. So almost all of it is absorbed by the government fiscal deficit. Now, if you thought that the government fiscal deficit was financing wonderful expenditures which are leading to tremendous good for the country, you may not mind. But the same people who look at those expenditures feel that they are all financing things that really aren't helping uh, the economy very much. So it's a serious problem. But I don't think the solution, by the way, is only reduction of expenditure. Because, you know, we need a more government expenditure in many areas. Our real problem is we're not spending enough on health and education and basic infrastructure, and we're spending we on other things. To begin with. Hmm? We have too, too small a foreign service to begin with. That is also, by the way, entirely true, and I share that view. Because by, in fact, if you look at it <clears throat> by any standard, we have too few policemen, we have too few doctors, we have too few nurses, <clears throat> so we need... Too few judges. That's also true. We have too few judges. So there is a, a large-scale expansion needed in the size of government. The notion that the Indian government is too big is false. What is true is that India is not collecting the tax revenues it should. You know, the total tax revenue of the center and the state, I think, comes to about 16 or 17 percent of GDP. And lots of research shows that for India's level of development, it should be at least five to six percentage points higher. So I think uh, uh, on the fiscal side, the major problem is we're not doing a decent job of collecting taxes. And I'm not saying we should raise tax rates. We're just not doing a decent job of collecting taxes at the modest rates that we've got. So I mean, do you believe reducing tax rates improves compliance? Is but that you know, the experience <clears throat> of 91? No, I think uh, it depends on the level you start off with. I mean, a, a very high tax rate uh, discourages compliance. But the idea that you should always, any reduction in tax rates will improve compliance is not actually true. And uh, in my view, for example, the reductions in taxes that took place for the GST were not justified. Not justified. You know? Um, the problem is that it's very tempting to reduce taxes because if you reduce taxes, you get applause uh, in the parliament, public, and all those sensex uh, numbers in the budget shoot up and so on. So it's tough. So, yeah. But sir, do you trust the numbers that the government puts out? There's a lot of concern over the transparency of the credibility of India's statistics. I think that is a new, I mean, I mentioned in the, my last chapter yes, uh, that this is a major problem. And I feel that, you know, for example, I think the government has recognized that uh, people are worried about this. What they've done is to set up an advisory committee. It has excellent people on it. But you know, an advisory committee is only an advisory committee. What you need to do is to set up a first class statistical system, professionally run, and the clearance of statistical data should not be subject to ministerial control at all. In the UPA, we had done that but in the India sense is a that unique country with a minister for statistics. Yeah, uh, it's a. So what does he or she do? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you're making a good. We have a minister of everything. I mean, you know, uh, anything that people think is of importance is felt it must be associated with some ministry. But you, you certainly need a statistical but system. We were fortunate that before Government of India discovered something called information technology and set up a ministry, IT had moved ahead. <laughs> it took a long time. No, no, I think you're right. I mean, in those days, IT was looked after by the Department of Electronics. Electronics, yes. Uh, but, you know, the biggest, the biggest thing for IT had to be a revolutionizing of telecommunication, which is a different ministry altogether. So actually, I mean, uh, this is the silo problem. I tell this story, I think uh, Rajiv Gandhi as fina uh, prime minister, after he went to the US, I mean, he was inviting, he wanted high-tech foreign investment. 
And uh, Texas Instruments wanted to set up That was the first, by the way, that came to Bangalore. Yeah. Uh, and uh, everybody said, that's great. Texas Instruments is coming. Wonderful. Lots of software engineers. It'll give jobs and so on and so on. And then it turned out that uh, Texas Instruments wanted uh, satellite connectivity with Houston so that their center here would work directly in contact with Houston. But the Department of Telecommunications did not have the capacity to manage such satellite connectivity. So they said, that's not a problem at all. We'll hire a satellite from somewhere, and we'll run an earth station and connect. But then telecom was a monopoly of the government of India. And I think Mr. Gandhi very wisely gave the signal that, look, we must solve this problem somehow. And a very innovative solution was found. Texas Instruments brought in the Earth Station, also brought in the technical guys to man it, leased that to the Department of Telecom. So it became technically a telecom department facility. And they put a guy on top running it. But the end result was that Texas Instruments got located in Bangalore. This is and the Sukhoi 30 method. What? You, you bring in the kit, you bring in the engineer, <laughs> then you say made in India. <laughs> Sir, Professor Painton. Uh, I want to give you some figures. Uh, in 1996... Sir, 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 again, yes, Professor Painton. Huh? In 1996, China spent 0.56% of its GDP on R&D. India spent 0.65%. In 2015, China spent 2.06% of its GDP on R&D, and India still 062 during your time in the planning commission, did this topic come up that we are spending too little on R&D and its impact on manufacturing capability in India? And did anybody from the scientific community had enough say to come up to you or to the government and say that we are spending too little on R&D? Well, well, if I uh, can just declutter this for you, China's, per, China's Economy now is five times the size of India's economy. And China, in percentage terms, is spending four times as much as India, which means China is spending 20 times as much as India on research and development. I mean, that story can be multiplied not just for research and development, but for many other things also. <laughs> so, uh, but, but coming back to your question, uh, yes, the short answer is yes, it did come up. Our own view was that we need to do a lot more. I made an interesting, I thought was an interesting suggestion at the time. I said, look, one of the problems with our research and development is that we do research and development by allocating money to various public sector research units. I said, why don't we set up a national research fund and let public and private and joint venture units compete for it so that we don't have we don't give, uh, we don't spend the money by putting it in somebody's budget and then tell them, uh, you are the institute for whatever it is, research on oil seeds. Now you go and do research on oil seeds. Let's just set up a National Science Foundation type fund and let them decide who's got a good idea. It doesn't have to be a public sector research laboratory. It could be a joint venture. Uh, none of the scientific departments were in favor of this, by the way. Because they didn't want to lose the budget that they had. Of course, then I said, look, let's set up a, a new fund, an extra fund. But then the, there wasn't enough money to do that. So, I mean, you know, we lost out on uh, things that we need to do to make the research more effective. Now, you know, this is, I would say, research and development, and I've said that in the book. That's one of the areas where we need to spend more money, government money. But it's an interesting question of how do you spend that government money? Do you just allocate it to the budget of existing institutions? Uh, I would say we should spend more, put in a large fund and make it open for people to put in projects and compete. By the way, all over the world in developed countries, that is the way people are giving research funds in a competitive grant mode rather than allocations to institutes. Yeah, I agree, I agree, I agree. No, I mean, I... But I, why wasn't this done, sir? That question can be asked about many bright ideas that floated <laughs> around for many years and probably are still floating around, you know. 
Ramya has, has a follow-up on that. Uh, so going back to data, you know, is it really possible for the government to not interfere with data? Absolutely. Because Absolutely. Uh, by the way, during the UPA regime, we had set up the National Statistical Commission. We set up a chief statistician of India. You know, originally, all these NSSO, they used to be in the planning, under the Planning Commission. I moved them out. We set up the National Statistical Commission and laid down the, uh, the framework that the commission would be the final say in whether the data are released or not. The ministry will have no role in it whatsoever. But you didn't give it statutory backing, right? Yes, that, which, uh, I mean, you know, there was a proposal that it should become, uh, I mean, if we had given it, I agree, we should have given it statutory backing. We, we worked that system. Look, we assumed that, you know, in all this statutory backing business... Do you trust the data that's coming out of this government now? Well, that depends on what you mean. Look, I, I, when you say trust the data, I mean, I think, for example, I would still say that survey data uh, are not easily manipulated. Uh, so my guess is that all the survey... I mean, for example, in the case of the um, employment survey, uh, the data was not fiddled, but the survey wasn't released until after the general election. So that suggests that the data was all right, but it wasn't released the way it should be. Internationally, I mean, the uh, statistical system should have predetermined dates of So release. what happens to a country's credibility when data which is available, a survey is done, is deliberately held back until the election? Does it affect a country's credibility or it doesn't? Look, uh, in the world of data, it does. And uh, it's one of those things, you know, if, uh, if everything is going well, everything is forgiven. But when things are not going well, then people point out that, you know, uh, why are things not going well? And then the government says because of A and B. And then somebody says, oh, but we can't trust your data. This is not just in India. I mean, in Greece, for example, when they had their crisis several years ago, uh, it turned out that they were fiddling the budget deficit massively. But uh, our data should not look like Greek to us. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go, yes, sir, one in the back. And uh, I want to ask you a simple question. You said that Manmohan Singh... Tell us your name yeah. and what you do. Abhishek Mishra. I'm a BJP youth leader and also a writer. So you said Manmohan Singh was constrained in UPA too because of the coalition dharma. But there is, you know, history does not bear out to be the truth because Atal Bihari Vajpayee is remembered by majority of Indians as his coalition government from 19 and 2004 was the most probably one of the ideal governments we have had. So coalition dharma should be a constraint for development. That is not true. Vajpayee ji delivered maximum development having a coalition. So, if Manmohan Singh could not deliver from 2009-2004, yeah, the question is that your statement does not bear with, you know, with historical facts. So, do you think your statement should be uh, changed again? You are saying that Manmohan Singh could not deliver because he was in coalition, but, but Vajpayee delivered. So, what is your view on that? I didn't get the, what's, I mean, maybe the, uh, the Just echo is… Uh, ask your question sharply, one line question. Okay. Again, I am asking. Manmohan Singh, you said, could not deliver because there was a coalition government. There was a coalition dharma. I said he himself has said that coalition yeah. dharma but was a constraint. But Vajpayee could, could deliver despite running a bigger coalition government. No, no, but let yeah. me, I think your, uh, the proposition that Manmohan Singh didn't deliver needs to be clarified. The UPA government was there for 10 years. In the first seven of those 10 years, they delivered an economic growth rate of 8.4%, higher than anything before and higher than anything after. Until, it is, until we have a notification at 5.47 in the morning from Rajpati Bhavan one of these days, saying that your growth rate is 12%. Well, <laughs> uh, two, in that period from 2004 to 2011, you had a big decline in the percentage of the population below the poverty line. You know, this has happened before in India. That the percentage has gone down. But since population expanded, the absolute number below the poverty line would be a little higher. This is the first time that the absolute number went down by 138 million. I also mentioned that the achievement of the nuclear deal was a transformative change in India's foreign policy technology position. Many of the things that today 
rightly, are viewed as the basis of new technologies, digitalization, etc. The expansion of telecom connectivity, Aadhaar, financial inclusion, regulatory changes by the Reserve Bank, enabling many, many small accounts to be open. All of this was done in the UPA government. So the proposition that uh, the UPA government achieved nothing, in my view, is false. What Manmohan Singh said, in particular contexts, and I think it was in the context of the 2G, when people were saying to him that, look, uh, why don't you take action against the minister concerned? And that's the context in which he said, look, and, uh, you have to be guided by coalition dharma. I discussed that in the book. And there's a real issue here, because you know, um, if you whip up, uh, and the media helps in doing that, whip up a sentiment that something horribly wrong has happened, <coughs> the public naturally wants instantaneous recourse and uh, correction. The Prime Minister then, his view was, the law must take his course. I mean, he said in Parliament that some of what is being accused of is not valid. Some aspects seem to be questionable, and the law will take its course. And the Minister concerned resigned. The trouble is the law took several years to take its course. By then, attention had shifted. And I think we are running a politics in which it's very easy for someone to make a particular thing an issue and then expect that somehow the government will solve the problem. Now, uh, when you're handling, when you're dealing with your own ministers, it's a little easier. You know, I mean, the, the law minister, Ashwini Kumar, uh, had asked to see uh, the affidavit which the CBI was going to submit on coal, and uh, the court had told the CBI not to share it with anybody, and that was felt to be perhaps wrong, and so he resigned. But it was easy for the prime minister to do that with his own party, saying, look, I think, you know, let's, uh, let's defer to public opinion. It's not so easy to do it for a coalition partner, because a coalition partner would say that, look, the opposition is just whipping up uh, wild allegations, and you can't act on the basis of wild allegations. They would say, let the law take its course. And by the way, it's interesting, in the case of 2G, when the law took its course, the minister was acquitted. I mean, several years later... Everybody's the, acquitted, telecom is finished. <laughs> All way to being finished. So anyway, I, I just want to set the record right on that. May I? I uh, uh, sir, uh, there'll be and then... I'll just briefly touch on the curve. Please tell us who you are for... I'm Dalbir Singh from the Congress Party. Uh, Montek, I'll touch upon the current economic scenario. Everyone knows the situation is very dismal, whether it is liquidity, squeeze, or it is contraction in credit, or it is all core sectors of economy, manufacturing, service sector, everything facing hardship. And uh, we are possibly 4.8% growth for this particular term, uh, possibly one of the lowest in the last six years, compared to period during when you were there in UPA 1 and 2, we had 8.5% 8, 8 like you said a little while ago. Yeah, I'll come to the question. If you were a finance minister today and you enjoyed as much confidence of the Prime Minister as you enjoyed of Dr. Manmohan Singh, what will be a couple of big things that you will do to revive the state of economy today? Well, I mean, this is very tough. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't throw a question to an unprepared. First thing is whoever is the finance minister should look at the facts very in great detail. And I don't have that at the top of my head. But I, I mean, at the tip of my fingers or the top of my head. So I'm not in a position to say what we should do. But I mean, what I would do if I was in that position. But it seems to me a few things are very important. First, we must recognize are we in a difficult situation or not? Now, the finance minister has repeated the five trillion economy target for 2024 or 24-25. Now, if she is of the view that we are on track for that target, then she should just carry on doing what she's doing. But my view is that we are nowhere near uh, being on track. I mean, the present position is that the quarterly low point in growth is about 4.5%. Probably we will end the year be below 5%. To reach the 5 trillion target, the average growth rate, counting this year, should be 9% over six years. We're going to get less than 5, and maybe next year more than 5. We are not on track. So unless somebody gets up and says, you know, we're not on track, so now I'm producing a budget to put us on track, 
you don't get you don't get the right answer. Similarly, I mean, we have the target of doubling farmers' incomes by 2022. Now, if the and that was also repeated, by the way. So it's a simple question. If we are going to double farmer income by 2022, we should just carry on doing what we're doing. The problem is we're not going to double farmers' income. Agriculture is doing worse than it was in the previous period. And uh, frankly, there's no way in which you can double farmers' income unless you can take a lot of farmers off the land and put them into other jobs. And that's the other big non-performance, which is jobs. So I think the first thing a finance minister should do is to let the people know what the state of the economy is. And I mean, that, that would get people thinking. I mean, uh, two other areas where I can mention. Uh, one is uh, private investment. I mean, the big decline in demand is because private investment has collapsed. We need to know why that is so. Why is there a loss of confidence on the part of the private sector? The government has to engage with the private sector. I mean, Rahul Bajaj says there's a fear factor. Not clear what he meant. Is it taxation? Is it some of these other laws? Whatever. But you need to have engage uh, in a credible way so that people are reassured that's not a problem. Exports is a disaster. Okay. Now, here I'll make a very positive, a concrete suggestion. I think it was a big mistake to raise import duties. You know, one of the key elements of the 1991 reforms was that we are entering into a phase of gradual reduction in import duties because that is how Indian industry will become competitive. Which Vajpayee it's, continued. Yes. Narasimha Rao Manmohan Singh started it. The United Front government continued it. Vajpayee continued it. It's now been reversed. Now, it's interesting. I mean, we are on the one hand, we are saying that we must join, get a bigger share of global value chains. I think that's absolutely correct. The economic survey says that this is very important. And given the way trade is going, there's no way you're going to get good exports if you don't have a piece of the global value chain network. And the survey says the way to get uh, into the global value chain is to have low duties on intermediate goods. That's not what we're doing. So, you know, the economic survey was presented in Parliament one day before the budget, and the budget sort of jacked up duties. There's a complete dissonance between these two. So there are many things that really need to be, uh, need to be done. Uh, is it time that we do away with the economic surveys now that, you know, even the government doesn't listen to its own economic survey? No, to be fair, the economic survey Any is... Any resemblance uh, with the budget is not even coincidental. I think part of the problem, this is the economic, to be fair, the economic survey has never been a predictor of what the budget will do. Uh, but no, in the but old it's days, a predictor of directions. Now, you can't be going in different directions. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a fair point. I mean, that's, that's totally fair. Uh, Ambassador yeah. Rajan, yeah. Uh, one of our most distinguished foreign service officers. Did you say extinguished? <laughs> sorry. Foreign service officer. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> distinguished. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering what uh, your view is on India staying out of RCEP and also what is your response to the Commerce Minister's uh, statement that every free trade agreement that India has entered into over the past several years with every country has only been against India's national interest and should be uh, <coughs> revised or thrown out. This is in the context well, you know, of what you said about the gains that came I, to the country. I can, give you, uh, I can give you my view for what it is worth. On the issue of whether free trade agreements have been su successful or not, there's a very long section in the economic survey which says that the view that they have been harmful is wrong. So the minister would be well advised to read the finance ministry's economic survey <laughs> and then make up his mind whether the survey is wrong or he's wrong. Uh, take a look at the survey. I share the view of the survey. It's totally wrong to say that the free trade agreements that we've entered into have we had negative effects. Not true. On RCEP, I think it was a big mistake. Uh, Asia is the growing part of the world. This is the part of the world that we have been wanting to integrate with. I mean, earlier governments had announced a look east policy this government had announced an act east policy, and that made me feel 
that you know, we would see faster action. Uh, after many years of negotiations, India did not sign the RCEP. Now, by the way, I think we can still join. I don't know what the period is. That option is still open. 30th March, I think. Yeah, so I, I would, if I were asked, uh, we should join. No question about it. And quite frankly, uh, what sort of a face does India present uh, in East Asia if it says it cannot compete uh, with other Asian countries? It just doesn't make any sense in my view. And you know, especially because uh, uh, the fear is always it's that China, China would be a, is a big kind of uh, uh, fear creating element. There's a long period of uh, during which the duties had to be reduced, particularly the duties on China. So the transition period that was allowed uh, to allow full competition with China was quite long. And what we need to do is to do what is necessary to make Indian industry competitive in this period. So I think the decision on joining RCEP is extremely unfortunate. And I hope that the government will see the wisdom in what I'm saying and actually join which they still can do. Well, I mean, we talk about decisive governments and indecisive governments. Uh, to be fair to Montek and government you served in the past, that government gave, gave us the Indo-US nuclear deal. This supremely powerful government in five and a half years has not been able to give Trump the Harley-Davidson trade deal, tiny one. So weak governments can take strong uh, steps. So who has the microphone? Rachel? Hello. Uh, okay, you uh, and then Rachel. Good evening, everybody. I'm Udit Bhagga. I'm an entrepreneur. So as we were talking, you were mentioning like 1990s was the consumerism time where the consumer goods and all were on a boom. And then we have seen IT and other things. So what do you see the future from now? Where is the growth story for the next decade? And what should the government do to bring it up? Well, um, Read the last chapter in my book for what is worth. Well, there's copies of the book I, are outside. Please buy them. Montek will be here to sign them. <laughs> I, address, I address what I think is the answer to that question. But roughly, uh, I remain of the view that India credibly can aim at getting back to an 8% growth. Uh, that won't mean that you'll do it tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, the, to my mind, the... Uh, touchstone of success of a government should be, uh, is it getting back to 8% growth? Uh, and, you know, we should, we should not have targets only for five years from now. We should have annual targets and measure whether we are achieving them. I think this can be done. Now, it would take too long to make a list of things. I've already talked about some things. Uh, you need to move in that direction. Um, if you are going to get that kind of growth going, then there are two or three things that are very crucial. One, uh, that will only happen if private investment recovers. By the way, I don't, I don't think that the solution lies in foreign private investment. That's good. But it's in domestic, foreign, uh, domestic private investment because FDI is only a small part of the total investment. So it's no good saying FDI is increasing if the private domestic investors are somehow not, not investing. So we need to do something to take care of their problems. That's a big agenda. But I think if, uh, if the government were to sort of engage with the private sector and get a sense that what is it that you want, they would get a pretty fair idea of what is bugging uh, uh, private individuals. I think restoring uh, health to the banking system is overwhelmingly important. Also, bringing the fiscal situation under control. And bringing the fiscal situation under control is not... Uh, to be achieved simply by reducing expenditure. Actually, it has to be achieved by increasing total expenditure, but increasing total revenues even more. So you have to ask yourself, what are you, how are you going to do that? I mean, for example, I'm a great supporter of the idea of the GST. Uh, it was meant to generate more revenues. It has generated less. And the reason is it's been badly designed and badly implemented. But you know, unless somebody agrees with that, you can't have a correction. I mean, everybody, if you're just happy with saying GST is a reform, then there's no debate. Rachel? Uh, uh, Rachel first, and then you. Uh, microphone for Rachel. Thank you. 
Uh, sir, just to steer the conversation back to you, um, your name, Mantik, is quite unusual. Is there a story behind the name? What, what does this mean? If you could just let us know. These are millennials. You don't know what the name of the origin is. From where does the name Mantik come? Oh. What does it mean? That's very good, actually. I tell you, it's, it's quite amusing. Uh, the, uh, there's a little bit of uh, contextualization. See, I was born in 1943. And at that time, you know, the Second World War was going on, and the Indian Army in Africa uh, was much in the news. And of course, the general on the Allied side was Montgomery. And <laughs> Montgomery had a nickname called Monty. Monty. Okay? So uh, in every Punjabi family, whenever a boy is born and grows up, they say, hey, so military mein jayega, general banega, etc. So, I acquired the nickname of Monty. So after a while, uh, my parents said, look, they've got to give him a proper name. I mean, this is no good. So why not give him a name that will not force him to drop the nickname? So my father said, you know, I like the name Montek. You know, uh, sound good. And he spelt it M-O-N-T-E-K. So uh, somebody asked him that, look, uh, if it's Montek, are you spelling it M-O-N-T-E-K? And he said, well, Monday is spelled M-O-N-T-E-K. So <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong with that? <laughs> so that's the story. <laughs> so you can carry your nickname of Monty as well. Yes, that was the primary, because primary you know, purpose, yes. at that time, uh, most of the Indian army was out there. People were losing their lives. Jarnail Singh, Kaptan Singh, Karnail Singh. Yes, exactly, exactly. So this was going straight up to Field Marshal. <laughs> he hadn't become Field Marshal by then. Huh? He wasn't Field Marshal. He wasn't, yes. He later on became later Field Marshal. Later on, yes. Uh, not at that point. Uh, in the back and then, sir. And then uh, Shamsher and I think we'll have to wind up. Uh, no, no. Uh, in the back, he has a, you have the microphone, no? You will get it. Please tell us your name. Good evening, sir. My name is Akash K. Agarwal, and I'm an LGBTQ right activist and a designer. Sir, I'm 27 year old, young Indian, and I'm supposed to be the contributing Indian, but I'm right now fighting as a voice of dissent. We, as individuals who are supposed to be contributing for the economy at the micro level, are right now not doing what we are supposed to do because there is a huge anarchy possibly which we, we believe to be, and I see 40-year-old or 50-year-old in their comfort zone. So when I am supposed to contribute, but I have to stand for the equal rights, how do you see we will be able to go forward when the youth of this country is not in its comfort space to earn well? What is the way forward from the space of comfort, which 40, 50 years of people in bureaucracy? He, he says that you, I mean, 40, 50 years old, not you. I mean, we are a bit <laughs> older than that. Uh, they live in a place of comfort now. How long will it take for people in his generation, in 20s, to also get into that, that comfort No, no, zone? I mean to say that if we will be it, only it, considered a voice of dissent as anarchists, as not contributing Indians, because we're talking about rights, and if we will be considered anti-national, I would never wanted to use that word, but if we will be considered anti-national instead of contributing Indians, and if this is the vision of this is the eye glass this government has for us, what will be, how will we contribute at the end when there's no trust on people like us? That's tough. What's the operational question that I'm to answer? I think you have to give, uh, you have to give a call to arms. An optimistic <laughs> call to arms. No, no, the optimism, I tell you, is that uh, I believe that uh, with good policies and a lot of luck, India can go back to growing at 8%. If we do grow at 8%, then the people who are 20 today, by the time they are 40, which is like 20 years later, will be living much more comfortably, than, certainly than they're living now, and maybe even more comfortably than the 40s of today are living. But it all boils down to how do we grow at 8%. You know, the big problem is that there is no way of solving these problems if you don't solve the economic problem. 
and I also feel that uh, in, in economics, there's a kind of a tipping point. That is, if growth falls below a certain level, uh, you will have a great deal of uh, disillusionment so and social destabilizing. Yes. When it goes above a certain level, although many people still have problems, nevertheless, it will, uh, it will have a stabilizing effect on society. Uh, good evening. My name is Aditya Harkoli. Um, before I, um, I'll preface my question by um, commenting that I be, I'm one of those who believes that Dr. Manmohan Singh wrote the policy prescriptions of 91 uh, as much out of conviction as out of uh, necessity. Uh, perhaps the balance of payment crisis afforded him the opportunity to do so. Uh, the question is, um, the pro-market voices um, in the era preceding that, what, why did they fail to great, gain the amplitude and resonance uh, in the corridors of policy making and, and, and society at large? Sorry, wh why, in the, uh, why did they? Uh, in one line. Yeah. And in, the closer, in, the, closer to the microphone. In, in the era preceding 91, the pro market voices, the economists who were sort of championing those causes, causes, why did they fail to gain amplitude and resonance in the policy making uh, process? What took us so long to, uh, to, why did we have to wait for a crisis to th push ah. us in that direction? Well, you know, when you say the free market ideologies were, were there for very long, that's not really true. It's, it's in the 1980s uh, that the free market ideology in the West began to gain a lot of traction. You know, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and even Margaret Thatcher, I mean, it's really after uh, she won the Falklands victory that she became uh, uh, an aggressive pusher of her strategy. And that was not the strategy that was popular in Europe. So, you know, uh, I don't think that during the 1980s, we were not that far out of line. What changed, of course, is that uh, 1989, most of East Europe sort of decided to opt out of the Soviet bloc. And in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And that was a pretty, from the global point of view, that was a very important development. Around that time, virtually all developing countries began to sort of swing away from a heavily government-controlled uh, environment towards a greater role for the private sector. But you know, these things go in cycles. I mean, after the global financial crisis of 2008, uh, the pro-private sector mood changed quite a bit because the global financial crisis was seen by many people as demonstrating that reliance on free markets isn't necessarily the right thing to do. Now, I think this was misunderstood because reliance on free markets in the financial sector is not the right thing to do. And anyway, nobody ever thought that in the financial sector you should be relying on free markets. Uh, but in the, in the commodity space, the real sectors, I don't think there was any reason to change one's opinion on the importance of market uh, development. You know, in India, it wasn't just markets. It was also public sector versus private sector. And that is a long historical sort of perception that many people shared uh, that, you know, somehow uh, the private sector was viewed with suspicion and the public sector was a preferred way of developing. Uh, the fact is that the public sector did not live up to the expectations that people had. And many people also point out that that's because government controls it so much. It's not that the individuals are not capable, but as long as they are subject to government control, don't expect them to do anything. And I think we, we, we recognize that, it, it, but it's taken far too long. I agree with you. I mean, you know. Good evening, Mr. Aluwali. I have two questions. Stand up. Oh, I should stand up? Okay. And celebrities must introduce themselves. Oh, God. Uh, Pratibha Prahlad, um, I have two questions. My first one is that you touched briefly two upon. Two dancers here, Pratibha and Shobhna. She is here? Okay. <laughs> yes, right there. Um, so, my first question is that, you know, it's, it's about FDI. You touched briefly on FDI, but I do remember that in the latter part of UPA 2, um, there was a lot of discussion and uh, talk about uh, single brand, uh, you know, retail, FDI and single brand retail. Mm -hmm. 
and something happened, Walmart was supposed to come in, and then there was a lot of discussion, but nothing, you know, came through. So I would like your, uh, you know, you insight. Multi, you mean multi-brand retail? Multi-brand. Multi-brand so, retail and single-brand retail. Single FDI brand, and single-brand. Single brand you know, multi-brand multi -brand was not allowed. No, during the UPA two time. I mean, the, yeah. the latter part of it. My second, que you know, question is that: Do you think history has been unkind to Mr. Narasimha Rao, because he was the first prime minister who picked up a non-politician professional? Uh, to become the finance minister of this country, and that really, you know, saw a lot of changes. You yourself have spoken at length about Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, and that he wanted to bring about change. No. And you spoke about Did Dr. Manmohan IA, Singh. Non-IA finance secretary as well. Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, where does Mr. Narsim Rao's contribution stand in the overall history of India and in the history of the Congress Party? Special. Well, I can't, I can't speak for the history of the Congress Party. I think the, maybe Dalbir can speak. I don't speak. think anybody can right uh, now. Uh, but there's no question in my view, there's no question in my view that, you know, we would, not have, more important. <clears throat> we would not have had the economic reforms uh, if Mr. Narasimha Rao had not picked Dr. Manmohan Singh. I say in my book that it was clear to me that Mr. Narasimha Rao knew that we had to do things differently, and he was sort of outsourcing the design of the reforms to Manmohan Singh. He may not have been technically capable of putting together all the different bits and pieces, but I think he was, he, he was aware that this needed to be done. He backed his finance minister critically uh, during the security scam, for example, when everybody was going around saying this is because of liberalization, which is nonsense. Uh, but he backed him. Uh, Manmohan Singh actually handed in his resignation because he didn't want uh, the Prime Minister to be embarrassed, and Narasim Rao sent it back. Uh, so that was very, very critical. Uh, so there's no doubt in my view. <clears throat> of course, the, I mean, you know, I argue in the, uh, the issue of how much credit uh, should go. I feel that I wish Narasim Rao had been more upfront and led from the front. You know, that was not his personality. I mean, somebody, one of the, I, I, I report this story that one of the journalists uh, said that how come, to Mr. Narsim Rao, how come you've managed to make a 180 degree turn? And he said, no, no, I haven't made any turn. The world has turned under me. <laughs> now, was, there's that a very- That was a talk, because he said in a country like India, you, I, I asked him, how did you make this U-turn? So he said, in a country like India, you can never be seen to be making a U-turn. So I said, how does Narasimha Rao make a U-turn without anybody figuring that he's making a U-turn? So he said, suppose the ground under you is moving. <laughs> no, but I think, you see, this is uh, somewhere in the book I, I mentioned that uh, too much of our politics has relied on what I call reform by stealth. And they view it with great pride that it requires skill. Which is true, but you know, a reform by stealth approach uh, doesn't bring about changes in mindsets. Whereas a reform which says we've got to do things differently, and yes, I'm doing things differently, uh, would evoke uh, a sort of a different kind of reaction. But I think we've, we've had a combination of uh, gradualism, uh, which just says, look, uh, you can't shock the system too much, so let's do things gradually. Now, you know, gradualism could mean that, look, uh, I'm going to get there, but I'm not going to do it in two years. I'm going to take seven years. And then you have a measured movement in that direction. Uh, the other approach is that I'm going to get there, but I don't specify the, the, pattern, the, the pace. Uh, you just do it when you can. Now, I call that opportunistic reform. You know, you're not actually laying out a time path, but you're indicating a direction. And then, of course, the worst is reform by stealth, where you do the reform, but don't actually tell people that, listen, this is a big reform and it's going to help all of you. I think Raghuram Rajan uh, once pointed out that in India, uh, many people have uh, gained the benefits of reform without knowing that it was due to reform. I mean, for example, uh, ending the public sector monopoly on telecom and allowing mobiles to come in was the big thing that made a difference in the telecom area 
But he says that the carpenter who now goes around with a smartphone doesn't attribute it to the reform of 1991. Uh, it just happened. So I think there is, uh, it, it is important to rewrite write the narrative that we were doing reforms, we were doing things differently, and it's good that we were doing things differently. And we haven't had enough of that. Because, uh, you know, many people have uh, said that when the industrial policy resolution uh, was pushed through, the new industri the 91 industrial policy, they took it to the cabinet, and uh, within the party, many of the senior members said, no, 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 how can you do this? You're completely changing everything, et cetera, et cetera. And then they were, went into a tizzy, and Jairam Ramesh has said that he was asked to help draft something. So he drafted a preamble. And in the preamble, it said, you know, in 1948, we had an industrial policy. Then in 1950-something, then we changed it, thus indicating that we've had several policy changes. And then everybody said, yeah, that's OK. Fine, let's have a new industrial policy. But even that was not, not correct, because the 91 policy was not just a continuation. Right. It was the first truly radical break. Departure. But they didn't want to do that. Yeah. La last question, I think, and then I think uh, Ramya yeah. Aswan and we are done. I think we've held you too long, and many of you, I'm sure, are hungry and yeah. thirsty. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Vivek Gupta. I'm cardiologist in Apollo Hospital, and I've been attending this program. Sorry for being late. I don't know whether this has been taken up or not. Uh, we are always talking about $5 trillion US dollar economy, which is, I calculated, this is 400 lakh crore of Indian rupees, approximately. So now at the moment, India is struggling about 2.9 trillion dollar US economy. Do you think this is, because US economy at the moment is around five. So do you think this is achievable? No, no, no. Economy much more. Much more, seven, about seven. No, 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 it's huge. 30. No, 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 no. Okay. Your question is about India. My question is whether it is achievable within few next four years, as is a dream of our prime minister, or what do you think that it will take much longer time because it has I been... Think, the, I, I think he answered this. He answered already. He answered this. He said the rate at which you are going, uh, we are not going to get next. there. But now if you can start growing at 9% for the next four years, then it's you possible. might get there. But right now, suddenly from 5 to 9, seems a little challenging. So this came up earlier. Can I ask one more? <laughs> <laughs> Can't say no to a because I've been your point. admirer. I just wanted to know. I mean, a frank idea, economy now and your time. Was it better off or it is going down? Just a very small, yes or no? That's when all. When you say my time, you Your mean time, when you were... UPA's time. UPA's, UPA's time, UPA 1 and 2. Okay. Uh, if you look at UPA 1 and 2 together, and that's yeah. only fair, it's a 10-year period. But at that time, our Prime Minister was the Chief Economic Advisor also. I mean, now, our Prime Minister was the senior most economist himself. Yes. So he didn't need an economic advisor. Mm. No. Uh, the UPA record on GDP growth for the 10-year period would be an average of something like 7.6 or 7.7 percent. We're not there in the last six years. The okay. average is much below that. So much below that, okay. we're not doing so well. I think yeah, and the last couple of years, I mean, for the last few years, it's been 6 percent, and now it's going to be 5 percent, below 5 percent. So that's... So uh, we have to work hard. We have to work very hard. Thank you. The entire episode of Rahul Gandhi clearing the ordinance changed the way, uh, you know, uh, the people look at uh, Manmohan Singh as a prime minister or his performance. And you say that you spoke to Manmohan Singh about it, or he spoke to you about yeah, it. Yeah, well, actually, the, uh, this is interesting because, I mean, um, uh, many of the newspapers have picked this up and said that Manmohan Singh asked me whether I thought he should resign. This is actually a misrepresentation of what happened. What actually happened was that my brother, who is a IAS officer who had retired and writes for newspapers, he had said that the, uh, in his view, uh, that the incident should have led Manmohan Singh to resign. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's a good idea for Rahul Gandhi to come out into the limelight and people are ready for his leadership and all the rest of it. So, you know, he sent me an email, because I was with the Prime Minister in New York. He sent me an email saying, look, uh, I've written this article, and I hope it doesn't embarrass you. So I went to the Prime Minister straight away, because I wanted him to hear it from me, and not from someone else, that I said, look, uh, my brother has written this, and you should read it. You know, younger brothers, what can you do? Uh, huh? <laughs> younger brothers, what can you do? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I, I said, look, my brother's written this, and you look. So when he read this, which said that in my brother's view, Manmohan Singh should resign, he turned to me and said, do you think I should resign? <laughs> it's not that he was thinking about it and he consulted me. It was a very natural reaction that your younger brother thinks I should resign. Do you think you, I should resign? And I thought about it and I said no. And I had good reasons for that. And the good reasons were uh, in two different areas. One is the substance of what Rahul Gandhi said. Which what Rahul Gandhi said was that the ordinance that the government was thinking of bringing, which would have altered the law and allowed uh, legislators who had been- Lalu Yadav to carry on. Well, that, uh, that would have been a consequence, uh, perhaps an intended consequence. But the idea was that if a legislator is convicted earlier, uh, you have to give up your seat. They found a way that no, you can keep the seat, et cetera, while, you are, while it's under appeal. Um, and um, he said, he went to, the, the Congress party was giving a press conference explaining why this is a good thing. And Rahul turned up at the press conference and gave his view. He said, look, this is all compromising with corruption. I don't think it's right. And he said the uh, ordinance is complete nonsense and it should be torn up. That's what he said. So Obviously, everybody picked up on this and said, isn't this insulting the prime minister and all the rest of it? And the prime minister should resign. Now, you know, I said, look, on the substance of what Rahul Gandhi said, uh, he was actually right. And the vast majority of people thought he was but right. Rahul Gandhi is always right. Well, but in this, party. in this particular case, he said, look, that's my view. And my, many people in my party agree with it. And I, th I felt it would be very odd for the prime minister to resign on this issue because it would imply how dare you say uh, that we should... Uh, it was the method in which Rajiv, okay, Rahul Gandhi so then, did it. Then it becomes a process issue. It's not a substance issue. So I think on the process issue, uh, at, later on, I think Rahul I think, said... I think some of us used the expression that government had, Manmohan Singh government had lost its Iqbal that day. Well, you and know, I, I think I, you guys like uh, uh, putting these things because in we don't know we ways. don't know such good English, so sometimes it starts. No, no, but Urdu you can you can say sensible things in Hindi. You don't have to. <laughs> I, I think I think the I think the key issue there was Rahul Gandhi later on said, well, maybe the form of words I used was not right. Well, Rahul anyway, Gandhi got his just desserts with forty-four seats and his second counting of fifty-two seats. So the, <laughs> so, so that that's been settled. So. Montek, before we let you go, a question that comes often to my mind. Do you think India has now seen the end of the economic bureaucrat? People like you, Vijay Kelkar, Bimbal Jalan, even people who came from, all India, from the IAS, Subarao, uh, YV Reddy, people who carried on through the tenure of many governments and different political governments, but kept continuity in economic policy making, plus also became specialists in the course of time. First of all, do you think uh, it is true that this, uh, this species is now gone? And second, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, look, uh, I, I don't think that the species, you can say the species has gone, gone. Because I mean, after all, uh, many, some of the best economists, at least in my time in government, were in fact IAS officers. And uh, now there aren't any who are economic bureaucrats from the IAS, except one who's gone to RBI, Shakti Kanta. Well, I mean, you know, I can't make a judgment about whether this is a fundamental change, but I can certainly say that if it is, it's very unfortunate. The economy is becoming much more complex. The economy is now much more integrated with the world. Technology is changing very rapidly. And you need in government people with a high order of technical expertise. You don't have, if you don't want to get them from outside, then you can take up the existing IAS and send them to the top universities in the world to get the right training. Uh, but any notion that you don't need the technical, this would be a great mistake, I think. It may be. So the very last question in the back, because somebody is standing, I can't see her. Jyoti, huh? Take it, Jyoti. I've got lights in my Sir, my question is what is the planning commission and Niti Aayog ke beech difference between the planning commission and Niti Aayog? What is the difference between the planning commission and Niti Aayog? 
ये तो मैं थोड़ी बता सकता हूँ बिकॉज आई हैव नो आइडिया वॉट नीति आयोग डज बट 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 आई हैव होल चैप्टर ऑन द प्लानिंग कमीशन एंड लेट बी से दैट यू नो द नोशन दैट वी वर डूइंग ओल्ड फैशन प्लानिंग इज रॉन्ग वी वर अवेयर दैट द वर्ल्ड इज चेंज एंड प्लानिंग हैज टू बी डिफरेंट आई टेल यू अ नाइस लिटल स्टोरी विच आई मैंशन इन द बुक Uh, when I went away to the IMF for three years uh, in the Vajpayee government before coming back to be deputy chairman, I was member planning commission at that time, and I had felt that you know the ter- the planning commission the phrase is very old-fashioned. It you know, kind of evokes uh, Soviet Union and that kind of thing. So in my farewell call uh, on the <coughs> prime minister, I said to him that you know. Even the Chinese have changed the planning commission. They call it the National Commission for Reconstruction and Reform. So why don't we change our planning commission name and call it something else? And Vajpayee ji thought about it for a while, and he said, "No, boy. If we do this, the left will be angry. You fellows do what you have to do, but carry on with the same name." So you know, I think the thought, the idea. that the important thing is not what it's called the important thing is what does it do and in that chapter i have identified four or five key tasks which the planning commission performed uh and i leave it to you and others to decide whether the niti aayog is empowered enough to do that now i mean some things they've have been taken away from them and they no longer they no longer involved in financial allocation And you know, frankly, in government, a lot of very few people listen to you uh, if you are not actually controlling financial allocations. So I'm sure this makes it difficult to make your voice heard. Um, that's a disadvantage. But on the other hand, if they're really working on evolving new policies and trying to persuade people to do the right thing, I mean, that's a good thing. But among the many reforms that Montague planned in Planning Commission, one was changing its name to Bhojana Bhavan, was it? No. Because you served such good dosa. That's a very old joke. It goes back to the 1970s. <laughs> that's right. The T.N. Srinivasan, because in those days, the ISI, the Indian Statistical Institute, used to be housed. Which is now BIA. Top. Because, uh, because it unfortunately shared its acronym with something else. No, no. The Indian Statistical Institute is oh, an oh, academic. Oh, I thought you meant no. Standards Institute. No, no, no. Uh, the Indian Statistical Institute used to be on the top floor, and uh, all those academics would come to the Planning Commission cafeteria, because being a government place, it had a better cafeteria than the academic place did. So they used to say that Yojana Bhavan should be called Bhojana Bhavan, Bhojana Bhavan. because <laughs> that is a very important role that it plays. in their lives so my take on that note i since i know all of us are hungry uh, we have to bring this to an end i wish we could have gone on but remember montek has just started writing he has lots of stories to tell he's not done yet and my request and going to montek is that the next one should be about the people he's worked with all his life and he should tell stories more than policy so when that happens we'll be back with montek so and good luck with this book it's a great contribution to contemporary history thank you thank you, thank you very much and montek will be available we have a felicitation yes please please rajat anandani from ifl our sponsors without sponsors will be no thank offer come and there'll be no spirit and there'll be no food are come 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 Good. Thank you sir. Thank you. Thanks very much.